just thank you for that. So, Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Man, it's great to be with you again this morning as we've been in a series uh, looking at how, again, we face our giants. And I've been working with students for a long time. It hasn't just when I was in student ministry specifically, but over the time of ministry, I've had the opportunity to be around students and, and talk to them about things that are personal meaning that there's moments where we've talked about their date relationships, we've talked about boundaries in those relationships, we've talked about things that, that matter, again, to their purity as young people. And in some of those talks, I've had the opportunity to talk about where sin enters the picture and how that begins to speak to our hearts and to our minds. And, and I used to use this phrase that, um, that the first look, speaking to the boys, the, the first look that you see that captures your attention, well, that's coincidence. It's the second look where sin begins. And I stopped using that after a student once said, well, so PK, that means the first look should just last really long. <laughs> Leave it up to students, right? And, and in this, I've, I've talked about with people, a friend of mine that used to say, I might, and he's married, and he'd say, hey, listen, I might be on a diet, but I can still look at the buffet. And these broken ideas, these, these broken images that we kind of live with in the Christian world and the Christian life that, that get us messed up. And in student ministry, they would talk to me about these boundaries, and, and they'd push back on some of the things we'd talk about because they would come with a question that, well, it's the wrong question. And it would always sound like this on the front end. Well, what's wrong with fill in the blank? And I've learned over time that as long as you're asking the wrong questions, you'll always get the wrong answers. See, the question's never what's wrong with it. The question is what's right with it. It's helping students understand that as long as you're looking at it from the vantage point of, of how far I can go or how much I can get away with, well, that's different than saying, God, what is right before you? And it's a very different conversation when we move into those moments, into, into that thought about pleasing the Father. And you say, well, Corey, why, why is it so important to understand what's right with it? Because there's giants in the land. There always have been and there always will be. And I want to tell you this morning that the giant of lust takes many forms. It's not always sexual, but it is always mental. In 1 Chronicles, if you have your Bible this morning, I'm going to point you to a passage where we find ourselves looking at the fourth giant that David and his mighty men would address during his reign. And here in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5, I want you to join with me. But again, if you don't have a Bible, if you don't own a Bible, we'd love to give you a free gift of God's Word today. That Today at our Next Steps booth, just let them know you'd like a, a Bible. We'd love to give you that today. But here in 1 Chronicles chapter 50, verse 5, it says, And there was again war with the Philistines. If you've been with us through this series, you've heard this time and time again. And there was again war with the Philistines. And Elanon, the son of Jer, struck down Lami, the brother of Goliath of the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a, a weaver's beam. We see in this brief moment, this snapshot in the Old Testament, a, a fourth giant that we see David and his men fighting. And, and really all we get is who's in that battle with him, which one of David's mighty men are fighting in this moment. And, and Elanon, as he approaches Lami, we, we see that this battle will take his life. And what descriptors do we get? What, what evidence do we get? Like, what's the story? And we don't get much. A matter of fact, really all we get is his name and the descriptor of his spear. And what else? He's the brother of Goliath. The brother of Goliath, which you already understand David dealt with back in his late teens. And, and we realize the story as we've unpacked that, that, that now his brother shows up on the scene and understanding who he's related to, what kind of spear he has and his name, that's all we get. However, I think his name gives us more. 
See, the name Lami that we see in the Strong's Concordance is actually literally breaking out. It's meaning, well, giving meaning to that name of foodful. Probably not a word you and I have used much. Foodful, meaning what? This guy has an appetite. Lami carries this picture, this ungodly craving in his life that, that dominates, and his craving, his appetite is for what? For war. You know? I think this morning, if we're honest and we, we ask questions that I hope we do each and every week, it's why we come. It's why we sit in these moments. It's why we soak up God's word in a way that says, what do I do with this? How does this intersect my life? Like, how do I live this out? And, and I think all of us this morning would have to ask a question, do I wrestle with ungodly desires? Do I wrestle with these ideas of lust in my life? Do I, do I wrestle with this appetite for more? Do I wrestle with lust or sexual immorality? Do you feel this pull in your life towards some things that are, that are just cravings of the flesh? Do you struggle with this desire for power? Do you struggle with this desire for, for jealousy? Do you struggle with this idea for fame and, and for pleasure? And I think for many of us here today, we would say, yeah. PK, if I'm really gut level honest, I do. I struggle with these things. Paul addresses this in the New Testament when he's writing to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 7, verse 21, and he says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Listen, in every one of our lives, is in every life of a believer, this giant of lustful desires is lurking in the background. It's still seeking like that adversary roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. It's present, it's lurking. And here's the thing, in, in Paul's life though, the battle that he recognized was present, that he knew was evident in his walk, in his daily living, Paul's life is not characterized by defeat. Paul's life, time and time again, marks a life that's being lived in victory. And even though Paul recognized the war that's raging, Paul recognized the battle that was right before him, his eyes and his heart, his life's not characterized by defeat. And let, me, let me help you this morning. God doesn't want you or me to live a life of defeat. He's called us to be a people of victory. And maybe you're here today and you're honest, you're saying, oh, I don't, I don't, oh, I just wish I didn't come today. Like, he's going to talk at me, like, did you, did you see it? He's looking at me. Like, 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 I get that all the time, like, why did you keep looking at me? I don't look at you. Like, you're not that special. I love you, but, but I don't preach a message for one person. But you're sitting here like, oh, he's reading my mail. Like, this week's been brutal. This week has captivated me, and it's just, it's wrecked me. And so, if you're here today and you're, well, there's a struggle in your life, I want to help you by walking through a couple of things that I believe will help you understand victory. Corey, how do I get there? How do I live in that? Corey, I'm wrestling with the flesh. I'm I'm wrestling with my desire for alcohol. I'm wrestling for my desire for drugs. I'm wrestling for a desire for pornography. I'm wrestling with this desire to have gluttony played out day after day. I'm wrestling with jealousy and sexual immorality. Like, Corey, it's me, and I believe I know Jesus Christ, and my life doesn't mirror that. And, and I just, I just want to quit. Well, God wants to teach us something today about having victory over the giant. And number one, I would say this. It's time to recognize the enemy. Recognize the enemy. See, our passage here in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, I want you to see the, the enemy's name again, Lami, foodful. And, and I think as I look at this, like I step back and I, and I examine that, just the pronunciation alone of this giant's name, Lami, helps me recognize where my problem really stems from the emphasis on me. 
the giant that you and I face, this evil desire that lurks around us, this, this part of us that, that wants to draw us into things we know are wrong, we know that God says, don't do. Well, the Bible's clear on this matter. It, it gives it a term. Scripture speaks about this being the flesh. There are two forms of the flesh in Scripture that we read, we can unpack, and, and the first form's pretty innocuous. It just simply means that at the time of birth, that for each and every one of us, we were born with flesh and bone, skin. Like, it's the outer trappings of the body, right? And we see that even with Scripture, when Jesus was born, what does it say? That, that he became flesh. What? So that that word would become flesh so that it would dwell among us. It doesn't mean that he was sinful. It just means that he was wrapped in flesh. He came into the world that way. But the second way in which flesh is used in Scripture, I think it's really important for us today. It's the part of you and I that we war with, we struggle against. It's the part of our makeup that wants to satisfy self. Me. And people will wonder all the time, like, where, where, did this, where did this struggle come from? Like, where did this idea of the flesh really develop? Where, where's this part that wants to satisfy me so much? Where did it come from in my story? Well, the idea of this flesh meaning nothing more than self-life, putting me self at the front of the story, well, you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Like understanding the narrative of what took place between Adam and Eve, a serpent, and God who dwelled with them in the garden, like understanding what really took place in that moment for you and I is vital in our relationship with the king. And people are like, oh, Corey, the early parts of Genesis are just allegory. It's just a fable. It's just kind of setting up some kind of spiritual narrative. No, not if you understand its purpose. And understanding the need for that moment to have truly taken place in order for the gospel to be necessary. And so in this moment in Genesis chapter 3, you find that this serpent, this enemy, has a conversation with Eve. And, and God had given them one command. Out of all the trees in the garden you can eat from, except for one that's in your midst, that you cannot eat from the tree, <laughs> from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because in the moment that you do eat from that tree, you will surely die. Like God's not cryptic. He's not given a riddle. This isn't like a, a Lord of the Rings moment where you have Bilbo Baggins and this, this evil little creature. <laughs> if you eat it from, like it's not that. He's simply saying very clearly, do this and it will cost you dearly death. And not death in the sense that they would fall down without breath and life come to a stop. No, that you would begin to experience the physical death of a body that would begin to decay. You would understand spiritual death from the union you have with the Father. You would begin to understand death emotionally, physically, spiritually. So what'd they do? They said, God, not your will be done, but ours. Eve says, not your will, God, but mine be done, which is the antithesis of what we see Jesus praying in the garden. Father, not my will, but yours be done. And so what happens is the enemy does something striking. He takes Eve in the conversation to a moment of taking it off of who she is as a creation of God, and he puts her eyes, her attention on the very thing God said, don't do. He says, hey, you're not going to die. And in verse 6, when she puts her eyes on the forbidden fruit, it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, food see, she saw it. She saw that the tree was good for food and, and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Why would they do that? 
because the enemy took hold of this self-life desire in their hearts. That's the flesh. Not your will, God, but mine. That's the flesh. It's self-life. And, and there's something that happens when we choose to live in this self-life. And we see it addressed when Paul writes to the church at Galatia in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you. As I warned you before. It's interesting. Hey, we've talked about this. We've got to talk about it again. That those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's speaking about a spiritual desire and actually speaking to those that have truly believed versus those that are playing the game. That's what the flesh looks like when we allow this self-life to take over. I say I want what I want when I want it. PK, I get it. How do I find victory? Like I, I'm not disagreeing with you, PK. I get it. I, I'm struggling with this. I, I've lived in this. I, I don't want this anymore. You know, it's time to recognize the enemy. The flesh of this self-life, the flesh that wars with our spirits. But let me be clear here this morning. This war only takes place in the life of a believer in Jesus Christ. See, if you're here today and you're like, what do you mean this war? Like, I, I don't understand. What are, you, what are you really talking about? I, I don't struggle with this idea of self-life. Well, because there's no conflict. What do I mean by that? The Bible says for the believer, there's an internal war inside of us. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7 when he says, the good that I want to do, I don't. The evil that I don't want to do, I do. And this was the war that was taking place in his flesh, this conflict. And the Bible refers to this again back in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may know not to do the things that you please. Here's, here's how it works. See, in the moment that you come to the place in, in your journey, and especially your spiritual journey, and you recognize there is sin in your life that you cannot, well, you can't atone for. You can't work hard enough to find forgiveness. You can't, you can't do enough to get this unmerited grace. Like you, you can't do anything hard enough, work hard enough, think hard enough, pray hard. Like it's the recognition that there is sin in my life that needs forgiveness that only comes through a savior. And it's recognizing in that moment that my sin has brought separation between myself and my creator, God the Father. And until that separation is addressed, through the recognition of a gift that was given by the king, his son that would die on a cross to bridge the separation as his sacrifice would pay my atonement. It would allow me to understand what it means to be bought and purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. So, Corey, that sounds like a lot. Like, whoo, like, hmm. Let me help you. How to had an amazing opportunity this week. I'm sitting at Foresti's Deli, sitting down with a guy that really is the first time we've got a chance to meet, and, and we just spend time talking. And he's, he's unpacking his story and, and talking a little bit about what he's walking through right now, and, and, and he mentions some, some religious backdrops of growing up in the Catholic life and, and just some different things that he's been wrestling with. It, it led to a moment about an hour and 15 minutes of us sitting there. Of me saying, hey, can I... Can I ask you a question? Like, if you, if you stood before God the Father today after some tragic accident that takes your life, like it took a dark turn there for a second, like, and he simply just asked you, why should I let you into my kingdom? How would you answer that question? And it was met with a, 
I don't really know. And I'm like, hey, would you like to know? Because there's really only one answer that that, that question demands. And I took out my phone and I handed it over to him and I said, and I opened up my Bible app and I turned it on and I just said, hey, it's in the book of Romans. Will you find Romans 3.23? And he knew how to do that. And he found, I said, hey, it's real simple right there. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's like all of us. That's it. And then I take him to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that uh, for the wages of that sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And then took him to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Then took him to Romans chapter 10, verses 9, 10, and 11. And we just walk through the simplicity of recognizing for all those that have sinned, there's a penalty for it. But the beauty of Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, 10 and 11, that, that he who confesses his sin and believes in his heart that Jesus Christ died and rose from the grave shall be saved. And I said, do you, do you want that to be your story? And right there in a booth in Foresti's Deli, he said, I do. And I was like, hey, would you, would you like to do that right now? And we got people and tables around us. And I don't care if they're listening. I'm like, I hope they get this. Like, revival's going to start at Foresti's in Oakdale. Yeah. And, 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 and right there, I just said, if you don't know, if you don't know what that looks like, I, I can lead you in a prayer that just helps you acknowledge your need for a Savior. And right there in the booth, he prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into his life and begin a relationship with him personally. That's when his war began. See, it's in that moment that when the Spirit steps into our life, when the Holy Spirit takes residency up in us, we become the temple, the address of a holy living God. A new presence resides within me that the flesh says, oh, it's on. There's a war now. Because the flesh wants to satisfy the flesh and and the spirit wants to satisfy God. The father and and this war just begins to go on and rage in our minds. And and if you don't feel the conflict in your spirit, in your life, it may very well be the fact that there is none because you've never really met the spirit of a holy God that desires to dwell in you. So we got to wrestle with that a little bit. That to connect with this and let it intersect our life, we got to have a, an identity of a moment where I stepped into faith in Jesus alone. And the Holy Spirit from the outside began to dwell on the inside. And for a true Christian, we feel this struggle, this tension. And it's a tension between the flesh and the spirit. And what's it really a war over? Control. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5, or chapter 20, verse 5 again, Elanon, he's, he's going against Lami. And the scripture says, and there was war with the Philistines again. And you know the thing about the battle between the spirit and the flesh? Well, it's continual. See, see what we read there in the Hebrew, the word again means there is a continuance. The continuance of God's people with the Philistine army again. It's a broken record. And it's the way that you and I have to recognize the flesh's place in this battle. And and the first step to gaining victory in this is recognizing the enemy. But I would say number two this morning, remember the cross. And what happened on the cross? It's where Jesus was crucified on your behalf, on my behalf. Jesus died on the cross. And and you might be able to sit back and say, well, yeah, I I know that's right. Uh Uh-huh. But not only did Jesus die on the cross in that moment, um, it wasn't the only thing that mattered then as of now. Like, if he just simply died in that moment and it became a historical event, it would make it somewhat powerless. But the power comes when you and I place a faith and a trust in that moment for it to transform our life. He was crucified for me. Paul says to the church at Galatia in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified for Christ. 
It's no longer I who live, but what? Christ lives in me. What Jesus crucified on the cross was the flesh. Not just his physical flesh, but the spirit of it as well. You see, when you look at Romans chapter 6, he unpacks this even further. He says, we know our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Listen, when you come to know Jesus Christ personally, you are crucified with Christ. It's why we have a picture of baptism every month where you are buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in the newness of life. You're crucified with Christ. That that old sinful self, that old nature, dead, crucified. Hear me, though. Your old sin nature is dead. Time out. Like, like, hold on. PK, if that's true, like if you're telling me that old nature has been crucified, like it's dead, why do I still war with it? Like why am I still in such a struggle about this, this, this desire that's all about me? Like why? I don't feel very crucified. I don't feel very dead. There's a part of me that really wants to do what's wrong, and I hate that. So what is exactly the Scripture's meaning when it speaks about the flesh being dead? Your old self being dead. Hear me. The old self is dead, but it's not gone. See, there's a big difference here. We say that when someone dies, they are dead and gone. But sin it may be dead, but it's not gone. Like, let, me, let me turn this kind of really awkward for a second. If I were to go to a local mortuary and say, hey, I need a dead body. And, and I were to have like a weekend at Bernie's moment where I put the dead body in my seat and, and we drive and we find a nudist beach. And I go out and I set this dead body up in a chair and I fix it just right. That dead body, as nude people walk by, isn't going to have a problem. Why? Because it's dead and gone. But if I sit by it, I've got a problem. Even though my flesh in that sin nature, it may be dead, I'm not gone. And why? Because the old self's been crucified with Christ, but it's not gone. He says in Romans 6, verse 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. He's saying, listen, you don't have to obey that spirit, that sin of lust any longer. Why? Because you've been given a new power in your life. That flesh has been taken out of you. It's been crucified. It's been rendered powerless. It no longer has authority over you. So scripture says, because that's true, consider yourself to be dead to sin. Now hear me. Your being dead to sin looks great on paper. But now you have to consider yourself dead to sin. You have to remind yourself that you are dead. You don't put yourself in a position of being tempted by the thing he put to death in your life. The Bible says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision with the flesh in regard to its lust. Listen, you want to start having victory over this giant of lust, evil desires in your life? Stop putting yourself in the position to go to war with it. Like, PK, I'm really wrestling with alcohol. Stop buying it. Pastor, I really have a hard time with pornography. Then put protections on your phone that notify your friends, your family, anytime you click on something that sends them a message saying, there's a problem. 
There's a cry for help. But Pastor, I, I, don't, I don't have people. Find people. There are people here that want to see you live in victory. There is a church here that would say you can live in victory. Students, if you're like, Pastor, I, I'm really struggling with this, and you don't come to the Rooted Ministry on Sunday nights, I'm telling you personally right now, there are students finding victory there because they're hearing what it looks like to walk together in this thing called life where they understand the struggle with one another and say, I don't want to do that anymore. I need help. I want somebody to come alongside of me. We render this flesh powerless. But here's the thing. Even though the flesh is dead, it's not gone. It's powerless, however, It's not voiceless. The flesh can still bark out orders. Picture yourself on a ship, and the captain of this ship is a mean, evil, cruel, ruthless captain who makes you feel shame and makes you feel uh, incapable, makes you feel horrible about the way you live and the things you do. But one day, that captor, that captain is overthrown and taken by others that will tie this captain to the mast of the ship and hoist it up. And a new captain is wonderful. He speaks words of value and purpose and hope and love for those that serve alongside of him, those that listen to his commands, those that, those that come into the servitude desiring to do what the captain desires for them to do. But here's the problem. When they hoisted the old captain up, they didn't gag him. And even though you love this new captain, there's a sense that when that old captain starts barking out the orders, you still feel a sense of obedience to those words because you lived under them for so long. And you feel this compulsion because the words are still being spoken regardless of how great the new captain is. You hear the old one barking out orders in your life. And how can you walk in victory over the giant of lust, over this giant called Lemmy? Well, number three, you rely. Rely on the Lord. Place a full reliance there. There's a, there's a beautiful picture that Paul paints for us in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8. And what Paul does in these three chapters is paint for us a process, an understanding of what it looks like to truly walk with Jesus. Walk with God. In Romans 6, he says, listen, you've been crucified with Christ. Your old self crucified, put to death. Consider yourself dead. You don't have to live in that world of lust any longer. And in Romans chapter 7, he says, listen, we got to be honest about this, folks. You still have a battle warring in your life, and it's exasperating. It's a struggle. He says in Romans 7, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? You say, man, I wish I didn't have to struggle through this anymore. John MacArthur does something uh, really unique in the commentary that he has here of Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 27, when he looks at verse 24, this idea of being set free from the body of this death, um, MacArthur points to the fact that he, he thinks Paul is referring to a native tribe that lives very close to Tarshish, where Paul's writing from. And here in Tarsus, he says that when Paul laments, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? He says that that Paul's living out a gruesome reality of this neighboring tribe. That when murder was committed, the sentence for the murderer would be that the dead body of that individual they murdered would be strapped to their back arms to arms, legs to leg, waist to waist, shoulders to shoulder, and that murderer would have to carry that dead body wherever it went. And when you start to look at it through the lens that what Paul's talking about here, until you understand a glorified body, you and I are going to battle with Lemmy. Why? Because the flesh is dead, but it's not gone. But in Romans chapter 8, 
He says, but there is a Holy Spirit. There is a power of the Spirit within me, and that is the way that I can walk in victory. Not only do I know I don't have to obey this spirit of the flesh, but there's a power within me to keep me pleasing to God. And you and I can walk in that. We can live in this life, and we, we can experience victory when I understand who's living through me. What do I mean by that? Who's living, who, who's got control here? See, in order for me to walk by the Spirit, I recognize what is yielded to the Spirit as I walk, right? I, I recognize what yielding my way, my flesh, my desires to the Spirit looks like, right? So how does this play out in my day-to-day? Now, men, for those of you that are married here today, um, and let me just preface this, I know a biblical model of headship. Don't get me wrong. But I also know who the boss is in my home. What do I mean by that? There are moments and decisions I would love to make. And I have the freedom and the right to make them. But I've understood if I want to make a decision that I know impacts the rest of the family, it's best if I run it through the boss. Like, it, it's a good move. It's a great career move for me to ask the boss, my wife, what her thoughts are on this matter. Do I have the right to do it? Sure, I can do whatever. But, but for me, I've understood it's just best to run it past the boss. And she's right here. And she's like, well, now that I know that. Like, 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 no, like I understand, we, we're 28 years strong. Why? Because I consider the fact there are things I run past the boss that I know when she's happy, I'm happy. But why would I care so much about day-to-day decisions or things with our family or parenting or finances? Like, why would I care about running it past her when there are things in my life I don't consider running past him? that I don't consider the boss, the king, the Lord of my life, that I would come before him with every decision saying, would this be pleasing to you? Would this glorify you? Would this edify you? And here's the thing, he's clear on the matter. He's not going to come back with a, hmm, I don't know. Like when you go before the king and you ask a question, it's not like men asking your wife what she wants for dinner. I don't know. I'm going to start a restaurant called I Don't Know. So that every time, men, you ask your wife, you know exactly where you're going to eat. I don't know. God doesn't respond that way. God gives peace. And God can remove peace that keeps us in a place of understanding where there's no peace. I don't move into that. I will wait upon the Lord. Why? Because they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I will bring it before my king. And I know I'm talking to people right now that are saying that I want the Lord to be my boss. I want to hear God say, you don't have to live that way anymore. I want to be rooted in him, not my flesh. I want to please God. And that's what Paul's desire was. He said, I want to do what is right, but I'm struggling. Listen, the only way that you and I can actually let this sink into our hearts is by yielding. Yielding to that which he is moving in our life. This isn't in my notes, but it just hit me. When when I was teaching my oldest daughter how to drive which there's a reason I have high blood pressure. Um, that's just one of the small reasons. Anyway, this is why I have blood pressure. But anyway, um, I digress. There was a moment when I was teaching my daughter how to drive, and we were on Gregor Street in Bridal Ridge. And, and if you're taking Gregor Street and you're going uh, west uh, from Ranger, from the, uh, the entrance of there, there's a roundabout at Willowwood. And And we were driving, and and in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, she's been taught all the rules. She's taken the lessons to to get her her permit. Like, like she gets this. And and we're coming up to this roundabout, which has a a principle that's really important to know. You yield to the traffic in the roundabout. Like, like, 
That's why the roundabout exists, which I hate roundabouts, by the way. Anyway, this idea, and so she's coming up, and and there's a truck that is barreling through. Like, it is just coming full steam into the the roundabout, and my daughter just keeps pulling out. I'm like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. And and she, like, freaks out. What? What? And and my daughter is, if you're watching, I love you, honey, but you're a high strung. And and in this, uh, she 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 weirds out. She's like, who? who and she she tenses up and she freezes. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. Dad, you drive. And I'm like, no, 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 no. But you have to know in in a roundabout, if there's any traffic in it, you have to yield to that traffic because they have the right of way. You need to understand who has the right of way in your life. You need to understand that you are yielding to something greater than yourself as you attempt to go to war with this flesh day in and day out. That you recognize who that enemy is, but recognize at a greater capacity who died to give you victory as you yield your life to the king. And that's why this morning we have the pleasure to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And tables here in the front and the tables in the back, we every month get an opportunity to see the visual picture of what Jesus Christ did in our lives in order for us to yield ours to him. That he yielded his desire for the will of a father so that he could be an atoning sacrifice for your sin and for mine. See, there's historical account of Sitting Bull, a native Indian chief, where he's explaining this this very idea. Sitting Bull is talking about two wolves in his life. One is a wolf that desires good, and there's another wolf that desires evil. And Sitting Bull was asked, well, how do you know which one wins? And he very clearly articulated, the one I feed the most. And maybe this morning the question for you is, what are you feeding the most in your life? What keeps rearing its ugly head because you continue to feed its appetite? You continue to give it preference in your life. And this morning, as you make your way to one of the tables here in the front or here in the back, you're, you're declaring. You're making a visual statement that I'm saying, thank you, Father, for giving your body and your blood so that I can walk in victory, so I can know the freedom of salvation that only comes through you. And today, if you're a guest with us, and and maybe you've never been in a moment like this, I just want to put your heart, your mind at ease and let you know, I'm not asking you to do anything you're uncomfortable with or you don't understand. Because if you're here today and say, Pastor, I, I don't think I know this Jesus you're speaking about today. I know about him, but I don't think I know him. Um, would, would you just simply watch the testimony of those around you this morning? You don't have to get out of your seat. You don't have to do anything. Like, like, can I just remove any of the anxiety or the fear of this one? Just, would you watch what's about to happen by those in the room this morning that say, without question, I declare I am a follower of Jesus Christ as I make my way to the table and make my way back to my seat. And could the Lord speak to you in this moment? Heavenly Father, today we recognize again who is center platform. Who has the spotlight of this moment? It's no instrumentalist, no vocalist, no preacher. Father, this moment is about you. And so, Lord, as we begin to make our way into a moment where we are reminded of the price you paid to bear our sin, to pay the penalty, 